Hey folks, Malforn here, and today we're going to be covering Dev Diary 150 for Crusader Kings 3. This has given us an overview of the two bookmarks that are coming and some recommended characters to play through your first campaign with this DLC. Or even if you don't have the DLC, if you are playing with a free patch, you'll also be able to do these. Just missing some of the features, etc. of the DLC, obviously. And then on top of this, they're also going to talk about some other new systems that are coming into the game. Some surprising stuff about how you can control your vassals a little bit better, some message settings, we had seen that previously, and some other bonus stuff as well. But we're just going to get straight into the start here. As I said, this first part is all around the bookmarks. Now, there's a lot of information here. I will say, as always, I will leave a link to this in the description down below. I'm not going to go through a lot of this. It is really just historical context. A lot of cool information. It's definitely going to help you choose new characters to do campaigns with, but I don't think there's much gain by me just reading through the historical knowledge of these characters. But as I said, a lot of cool stuff in here. Some things I didn't know about as well, so definitely worth your time reading. They do go into why they chose this start date. I know people wanted like a Charlemagne campaign. I know people wanted a Charlemagne start date, an Iron Sentry one. And really them saying like 1178, although at this exact time there wasn't much like historical paradigm shifting events going on, it was really a good setup for a bunch of things that were happening and also a good time frame for them to be having some Byzantine specific content. You've got the Fourth Crusade all that kind of stuff that you can get into relatively quickly. And then also outside of that, funnily enough, the Crusades brought up as one of the reasons why they chose this. You've got King Bedouin IV in there. You've got all the things that happened in that time frame. You've got the HRE Emperor Barbarossa. What was going on in the HRE during his time frame here? A lot of cool storage you can play out. And then outside of that, they are also going to mention about like England, the Mongols, a few other things. We will briefly cover those in this video, but as I said, if you want to read through it, it is there in the description down below. And really, this was them just explaining why they chose this time frame, how it feeds into Roads to Power DLC. You've got the Byzantine stuff, as I said. You've also got unlanded gameplay. That kind of fits quite nicely in this time frame as well. That obviously works in all the other bookmarks as well, but really saying like this is a cool time for you to play. Although there's not one massive thing starting, you are starting later in the game as well. So you've got the Black Death coming pretty soon. As I mentioned, you've got the Mongols starting pretty soon as well. You've got those kind of end game events that you can play through a little bit sooner and play out your adventures in those time frames. And then also you are further progressed in the game. So you are going to have better technology. You're going to get primogenitor in more places quickly. You're going to just have a bunch of further unlocks, different buildings, things like that, that maybe if you're playing the starter dates that we have now, you might not even get there. They do often say that a lot of players don't play to the end. And a lot of players probably don't even play much past this time frame anyway. So it is cool, I think, to get a later start date. You get all those unlocks. You get all that cool stuff. You've got a little bit more freedom almost to do some things that you want to do. And then also the kind of um, setup of the world has got a bunch of interesting things. There's not one major thing, but there's a lot of interesting things. And the first one they're going to call out is the Call of the Empire bookmark. This is the first one. This is focused around the Byzantines really allowing them to show off the admin government type. And then there's obviously other things around there. You've got Tamar, you've got the Seljuk Sultan, you've got other interesting campaigns that you can do there as well. As I said, they do break down the five characters that are highlighted with some information. A version of this will also be in the game. If you go to the bookmark screen, you do get a little bit of contextual history on the right-hand side as to why you might want to play as this character. And that is really what this information is as well. And then the second bookmark that we knew we were going to get is Swords of the Faith. It is funny. They do actually call out the start here. Like this one is very Crusades focused, but yes, there is no overhaul of the Crusades in this DLC or free patch. They are going to work on that later. They have have worked on it previously they do mention here that like they want to do real justice to the crusades they don't want it to be just part of a patch but they have done that i think twice before now where they've really tried to make some incremental improvements to the crusades i think they've had some relative success but not really that much and it does sound like we are going to get a full proper patch around the crusades i don't think it's going to be a full dlc i think they will just have a standalone patch maybe that is just crusades and it does change it. It depends. There are ways they could make major changes to this. I would be interested to see how they could maybe use the struggle system in some form where you would launch Crusade and then like a mini struggle would happen there and it might help focus the AI onto doing it. And it would also change up the gameplay a little bit so it's not just a normal war pretty much. You could have some little objectives, nothing too crazy, some kind of mini version of it with less objectives, but where you could kind of play it out a little bit more and then the endings would be where you could, you know, gain the land, a truce, something like that. I think it would be an interesting way of changing it up a little bit, make them play out a little bit more interesting. Now, we do know from last week, I think it was, we are getting a fourth crusade 
story of some kind. I feel that is going to be locked behind the DLC for the Byzantines. I think the admin government type will be free, but I think all the kind of flavor for Byzantines is going to be behind the paywall. And I think obviously the fourth crusade is going to be part of that. So it will be interesting to see how those events play out as an actual campaign of events. We will get more information, I think, before the launch of it. We do know there is a dev diary coming all around the Byzantine flavor. I guess that is going to be later in the year after August. They do say at the end of this dev diary that they are having their summer break now, which they have every year. And the next dev diary is going to be in August. And that is going to be around landless adventurers. We'll talk more about that at the end of the video, but I did want to call out we are going to get no more dev diaries for roughly six weeks, and then we're going to get on to landless gameplay, and I think they might cover some of these other things as well. But with all that being said, like I say, the second one, the Swords of Faith, being focused on the Crusades, it is cool. They do call out the movie Kingdom of Heaven. If you've not watched that, do make sure to do so, especially if you're going to play in this area. It's a fantastic movie. There is a director's cut, which I think is like four and a half hours long. It is fantastic, though. A really, really good movie. It's cool. They do also call out the CK3 mod called Kingdom of Heaven. That is a fantastic mod if you've not played it. I have got a campaign on the channel through it. That was a couple of years ago, and I know they've had a lot of updates since then, but definitely try that out as well. It is focused around this time period. It does have a fantastic model for uh, Bedouin IV with a cool face mask that he had. I do wonder if we are going to get a version of that in the base game. I'm not too sure. I think they should do it, as he's such an important character but I'm not sure if they'll do a face mask for one character, but I think they should do. But as I said, that is really the focus of the Swords of Faith bookmark. You can play out historically what happened in that area. I think there's going to be some cool campaigns there and a lot of interesting things you can get up to. They do mention here that Bedouin's elder sister, whose son eventually took over from him, if you play as her, she actually has a special decision where you get to choose the parentage of her child. That is interesting that that specific character is getting a special decision when you start the game or relatively early in your campaign if you do play as so that will be interesting to play through and seeing how you can kind of change things depending on what you choose and then outside of the actual bookmarks themselves they do call out a few other places they do say england and france is a fantastic place to play as well you've got king henry ii eleanor of aquitaine you've got king louis the seventh all the interesting things that happened with their history and how you can play through especially with henry's sons that's going to be very interesting to play through if you play as him and then play as one of his sons as we will see later on with what happens when you die you could potentially play as either one of his sons so that will be some really cool campaigns you could potentially get up to there and the next one they're going to talk about here is the hre you've got the emperor barbarossa you've got his staunch rival duke heinrich who is the duke of both saxony and bavaria and i'm sure there's gonna be some cool campaigns there where you can play as either of those and play out that feud and what happened the next one they're going to call out, this is Alfonso the Conqueror in Iberia. Some really cool campaigns you're going to get up to there, especially with how it's looking at this time frame. There's a few ways you could play out some different stuff. And you've got Portugal already formed. You've got Leon and Castile looking quite powerful. You've got Aragon with lands elsewhere. I think that's going to be a cool place to start. And then the last one, I think one of the more interesting ones as well, you're going to be able to play as Genghis Khan. He's 16 years old. He owns just this county here in the northeast of the map. And you're going to be able to replay the Mongols and all the adventures that he got up to. So I think this is going to be one especially interesting to play through. You're going to be able to see how far you can push west or even south, however you decide to do it. And then you've got the Black Death coming relatively soon after that happens as well. So there's going to be a lot of stuff going on there. I really hope they do put some more focus on the steppe area of the map. I think that is one area, especially even down into India, to be honest, the eastern side of the map past Persia. I think it would be cool for some DLC focused on that area in the future. There's a lot of cool stuff going on, and it is one of the areas that is generally not that supported DLC-wise in previous games that much. And it would be cool for them to get a bunch more and even more Mongol mechanics or something like that. And as I said, that is them calling out the bookmark places to play and even some other places that you might want to have some campaigns in. As I said, there will be a link in the description down below. If you want to read through the history, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. As I said, some stuff that I didn't know about and definitely some things that can inspire you in some campaigns in the future. But with that, we're going to move on to the second half of the dev diary. The first thing they're going to cover here is a special message. This was shown previously. We are now getting control over the message settings in game. So you can now choose which messages you see and how you see them. And as they say here, each type of message is put into a group, which kind of loosely is a collection of different things that happen within the same area of the game. And you can choose between the toast message, which is a banner that appears at the top of the screen. We've all seen those. A feed message, the ones that appear on the right-hand side, that 90% of the time I miss what they say, pretty much every time actually. And then a pop-up window, which is a new addition. We kind of had these a lot more in Crusader Kings 2. They're going to show that off as well. 
or you can just disable them entirely. There's definitely some of these I'm going to disable entirely because they do get super annoying, constantly getting the same thing popping up all the time. There's sometimes when you have voted succession when it just happens constantly, and I might turn that off, especially if there's one where it's very contested and I'm not that interested at that time in getting the pop-up every five seconds. But as you can see from the screenshot, these are the message settings, and you can specialize each one. Do you want this to be a pop-up? Do you want it to be a toast in the feed? There's some things from the feed I would like in the main pop-up window, and there's definitely some things in the pop-up or even in the toast option that I would put into the side feed or even turn off where I'm just not that interested in getting information about a certain area of the game. There's definitely some. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but there's definitely some where I'm going to turn them off. Let me know in the comments down below. I'm sure there's some you're going to turn off or, like I say, make them more prominent so you do see when they're happening. I think this is a really cool addition. Again, this is something that was in Crusader Kings 2. They brought it back and the UI is much nicer and it looks like there's a little bit more control over it as well, but definitely something cool. In the next section, they're going to be talking about Vassal Directives. This is what I was talking about at the beginning of the video. This is where you can give some direction, hence the name, to your vassals to do certain things for you. As you can see in the screenshot, half of these are basically the counselor options that they have, but you can now like ask them to do certain versions. So you can ask them to get their counselors to promote culture, convert faith, improve cultural acceptance. So especially if you take over somewhere, I guess if you can convert your vassal, you can now go in and say, hey, can you make sure you're converting your realm as well? I don't want to be spending my time doing that, which I think a lot of us do anyway. But this way, you can actually ask them to do it. You can also see in the screenshot that you can focus them on certain buildings as well. This will be especially useful for admin realms. As we saw last week, you can focus your different governorships in certain areas of the game. So you can focus them on frontier defense or building up your economy. And then couple with that, with this system, you can now even focus the governor or a vassal. This works in all government types, but... For this example, you can even go into your governor and say, hey, you're an economic governorship. Can you also make sure you build economic buildings? I wonder if this is brought in because the AI, you know, we know it's not the smartest of systems sometimes. I wonder if this is to prevent you setting up your governorships and then the AI vassals just building random stuff anyway, which really doesn't synergize with your governorship type. I imagine that's why this has come in. But as I said, it is usable in other government forms. Now, as admin, you do get some additional options, and they're going to go over those in a second. Now, you can't do this all the time. You do actually have to have the vassal respecting you. And as you can see from the screenshot here, these are the requirements to actually unlock the ability to tell them to do these things. Now, I will say some of these are way easier than the others. You don't have to obviously hit all of these. It would be pretty crazy if you did. You actually only need to hit one of these requirements. Now, the admin one, that makes sense. If you're admin government, it makes sense that you just get this unlocked and you can do this straight away. The second one, though, plus 50 opinion, I think that's relatively easy to get. I don't think that should be one of the options, to be honest, or it should be tied into something else. But I think them just having a good opinion of you. They actually do say here, as you can tell from the requirements, it's not easy to make them follow your orders. I mean, I would say getting plus 50 opinion is pretty easy. They actually put it together with having a high level of crown authority specific lifestyle ones, which I do like that they've added those, absolute control, honored to serve, having those unlocks in the lifestyle tree actually make this available for you, which is a cool way, as we've discussed in the previous videos, these new systems are getting hooked into older systems as they know everyone has these. Obviously, everyone has the lifestyle system, but it is cool for them to tie these into other systems so they all kind of work together. You are getting bonuses in each part and things like that. But as I said, they do group that together. So having high level crown authority, specific lifestyles, or having high opinion. Now, I would say the other two are significantly harder than just having plus 50 opinion. You do need to have a certain lifestyle. You do need to have high crown authority, which again, for most campaigns is not like super hard to get, but it's not the easiest thing to get. So I'm not sure if you look at those requirements, I think the plus 50 should probably go. I think that one's just too easy to have this level of control over your vassals. I think the other ones all make sense. Trusting, loyal, friends, lovers, having a strong hook, that makes sense. As we were just discussing, the lifestyle perks, they make sense as well. Having absolute crown authority definitely makes sense. And then having rank 5 legitimacy, that also makes sense because your vassals see you as legitimate and they would do as you ask. I just think that plus 50 opinion is outside of all the other ones there. I think they're more situational and that one you can pretty much have all the time in a lot of campaigns. So let me know what you think in the comments down below, but that is how I would change this. Remove that one. I've seen some comments saying they should make you have to hit two of these, but I don't think that makes sense. I think each one outside of the opinion one 
does make sense as to why they would follow your request. I think that does make sense. Just the opinion one I would change. And then as I mentioned previously, if you are an admin government, you do get some additional options as well. You could tell them to improve development, boost men at arms, recruit men at arms as well. And then obviously all the other options that you get previously. So yeah, if you are in an admin realm, you can actually focus this pretty well, boosting your men at arms, recruiting more men at arms. They're going to be really good for you. And then improving development as well. That is going to be useful, especially for your culture, trying to get it a little bit more powerful. That is going to be a cool option to choose as well. So I really like this. I'm really surprised they didn't showcase this previously, but I guess they were more about the admin government stuff specifically. And this is an addition that is affecting all areas of the game. As I said, all government types can do this. So it does give us a little bit more control over our vassals. And, you know, that is always a good thing. And especially how it's worked into these other systems where you don't get it straight away. You have got to work towards having these abilities, which again is pretty cool. And that covers that system. The next thing is not a new system. They had shown this previously with the announcement of the DLC. And that is when you die, you can carry on as you do now with your next in line. But you can instead choose a new destiny and they have made some changes to that system. I think previously it always showed you three random characters, and as you can see from the screenshot, that is the case still now. It shows you here your nephew who's landed, and then the other two are unlanded characters by the looks of it. I think that's what that helmet icon is. I think whenever you see that in the game, that means they're unlanded characters, they don't have a banner, and that is how this looked previously. But they have now added, as people kept asking for it, a continue as random descendant. There is a mod that does this, but they brought this into the game. So you can just click that and it will give you a random descendant and you play as them. I think this will make for some really cool campaigns where you just always press this option and see who you get. Now, one thing you can do though, and this is cool that they've thought of this, you can actually choose it to be random, but in a certain area of it. So as you can see, random descendant, random ruler, random new adventurer, random family member, you can specialize it a little bit so it isn't just truly random. Anyone that would be eligible for you to play as, can now focus it. So if you do have a lot of descendants who are rulers, you can say, look, I just want to play as another ruler. Do that, and then you will play as them. So I think this is going to be cool. You could do whole campaigns where you do this. Maybe you start at the beginning, play through, and you get a little bit bored of what you're doing. But then you can choose this option on one of the deaths that you have, and then it's almost not like a new game that you're playing, but you've got a whole new scenario, a whole new way to play through and you can have some adventures. And it's kind of cool that you can watch what your old character would have been doing if you would have been playing as them. So I really like this system. As I said, I'll probably do some campaigns or some live streams where I just choose random descendant each time and we see what we get up to. But it is cool that they've listened to the feedback and added this additional mode. And not just random, as I said, being able to specialize it a little bit as well is pretty cool. But with all that being said, that is the end of the Dev Diary this week. The main focus being the bookmarks, showing us what we are going to get as the recommended characters, but then also these other systems they've talked about as well. Do let me know what you think about them. I think that uh, Vassal Control System is awesome. And as we've just discussed, that new Destiny option as well. But as I said at the beginning of the video, that is going to be it for Dev Diaries for the summer. They have this break every year where they take, I think, four to six weeks off, and then they come back after the summer. And they do say they will return in mid-August, and that is when we are going to start getting unlanded character Dev Diaries. So I cannot wait for those. It's unfortunate we've got to wait that time, but, you know, I'm happy they get a bit of a summer break and they get to recharge their batteries, come back, tell us all about what's coming, and then it won't be long until the actual DLC is in our hands and we get to play it. So, yeah, we will have to wait a little bit longer for Landless Adventures. They do call out that as being the first dev diary. And then we'll see if there's any other kind of landed people. As I mentioned, there is Landless Adventures and there are Landless Nobles that are locked behind the admin government type. But this one isn't going to be, obviously. And we'll find out about those and if there's any other Landless campaigns you could do. And really how that system works. Can you do different things? Can you be a tournament person where you just go around doing tournaments and feasts and things? Or can you actually lead armies yourself? Can you lead a mercenary company, do really well with it, and then somebody will come to you and say, hey, do you want to settle your mercenary group? I will give you this land and you'll become part of my realm. I imagine it's going to work something along those lines, but we will get more information, as I said, in August. But with that, we'll leave it there for today. As always, hit that like button if you enjoyed today's video. Subscribe if you're new here. I cover Crusader Kings a lot on the channel. And I'm also covering EU5, especially at the moment. With the ramp up towards official announcement and launch, they are doing some dev diaries, so you can get an early look on how that game is going to work. It's been fantastic to follow that so far. But with that, we'll leave it there for today, and I'll see you in the next one.